Hello, and welcome to the first A&P Journal Club. My name is Laird Sheldahl, or as my students like to call me, Professor Smarty McAwesomeson. Today, I would like to go through a primary research article as an excuse to review some of the material that I cover in my 200-level A&P class at Mount Hood Community College. That is located in Gresham, Oregon. As you can see, that's me over there to the right. If you go to Mount Hood Community College, you might recognize me as the professor who's always wearing a tie and boots, but I'm not that other professor who's always wearing a tie and boots. So today I would like to talk about a journal article about giant cell tumors and use that to review some anatomy material. For those that wish to follow along with the primary research, you can find this article in a 2015 publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Luckily for me, these authors wrote a much shorter perspective article, summarizing all the key points for me, which really helped in this presentation today. Let's start with the title. Structure-Guided Blockade of CSF-1 Archinase Antenosynovial Giant Cell Tumor. So, let's start with this pair of words, tenosynovial. Teno refers to tendons, and synovial, as you remember, refers to synovial joints that we learned about in the first term of a and Next up, the giant cells today are going to be monocytes, that differentiate into macrophages and osteoclasts. So we'll start with the white blood cell, but then we will remember that those white blood cells are related to osteoclasts, cells involved in bone tissue health. Next up, let's talk about CSF. You remember that abbreviation from second term a and it could stand for cerebrospinal fluid, but today it's referring to colony stimulating factors, the hormones that drive the differentiation of our different types of white blood cells. And lastly, the letter R here stands for receptor. We're going to be focusing on a cell surface receptor for one of those colony stimulating factor hormones, and it's gonna activate a second messenger system and the authors designed a drug that would block this second messenger system from being activated. Let's start by reviewing our white blood cell physiology. We're gonna focus on a white blood cell today called a monocyte, which was one of our two A granulocytes that we have. The other one, of course, being a lymphocyte. These two looked rather boring under the microscope. A little more interesting to look at was a neutropil, which had that funny shaped nucleus. Hence, you could call this a polymorphonuclear leukocyte if you're not into the whole brevity thing. This was one of our granulocytes, meaning its cytoplasm had a bunch of grains that showed up under our microscope. Next, let me draw a basophil over here. Basophils, as we remember, had a nucleus that was shaped like an old-fashioned telephone, and then a bunch of really dark grains in their cytoplasm. Our fifth one was an eosinophil, and I've got just enough space to draw one over here. And what was most noticeable about these is that the grains took up that red stain eosin, giving the cell its name. So we've got our five white blood cells. Now, using our mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas, we can remember that neutropils were the most prominent. Lymphocytes next, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils were all fairly rare in the bloodstream we're going to be focusing most heavily today on these monocytes. Now a better way of classifying these five white blood cells is based off their lineage. Lymphocytes came from a lymphoid precursor, whereas the other four came from a myeloid precursor. 
So these are stem cells here that can become one of the five different types of white blood cells. And both of those stem cells come from an initial stem cell found in the bone marrow called a hemocytoblast. So all of these arrows here represent decisions that that hemocytoblast has to make in deciding whether to differentiate into a lymphocyte, a neutropil, or any of the other white blood cells. And these decisions are guided by hormones called colony stimulating factors. So there's a different CSF for each one of these arrows driving that initial stem cell down the lymphoid versus the myeloid pathway. So today we're focusing on this guy here, the monocyte. But another interesting cell is this myeloid stem cell precursor. When this guy becomes mutated, it can turn into a cancer called chronic myeloid leukemia, which is treated by a drug called Gleevec, which is another chemical that we will be discussing in the paper today. CSF1 binds to a cell surface receptor called CSF1R. This is a tyrosine kinase that can move a phosphate from ATP onto a second messenger. That activates the second messenger, which in turn allows this cell to pass through the G1 cell cycle checkpoint. In tenosynovial giant cell tumor, there's mutation in this receptor, which means that it's always activated, even in the absence of the CSF1 hormone. This leads to an overproduction of monocytes. The authors targeted this receptor with a drug that would bind and prevent the activation of the second messenger, thus stopping the cell from entering the mitosis phase. The authors started with a chemical that is used to block a number of tyrosine kinases in a laboratory setting. And using X-ray crystallography of the CSF1 receptor, designed a new chemical that was more specific for CSF1 as opposed to a number of tyrosine kinases. The hope is that this drug would bind to the activated receptor and prevent the binding of ATP, which would block the activation of the second messenger, which would in turn arrest this cell at the G1 cell cycle checkpoint, preventing the tumor from growing. In the current study, this new chemical called PLX is being used in addition to an older drug called Gleevec. Gleevec can inhibit other activated tyrosine kinases, such as the Philadelphia chromosome, which causes chronic myeloid leukemia. The significance of these two chemicals is that unlike older chemotherapeutic drugs, they don't kill off every rapidly dividing cell, but only cells that are dividing rapidly under the instructions of tyrosine kinases. And in the case of the PLX compound, under the instructions of one specific tyrosine kinase, the CSF1 receptor. Tenosynovial giant cell tumors occur in synovial joints, such as the knee joint. These joints can have tendons, a number of different cartilages, and a number of ligaments that all help hold the joint together and keep it stable. Then they also have synovial membranes, which form a cavity full of synovial fluid. The function of this fluid, as you will recall from first term anatomy, is primarily lubrication and nutrition. This fluid is slippery because it's full of glycosaminoglycans, which allow the bones to slide past each other easily as they are working. If you put enough force on this fluid, however, it acts as a non-Newtonian fluid and instead turns into a gel, which can absorb shock. In tenosynovial giant cell tumors, synovial cavity is full of cells instead of synovial fluid. These cells resemble monocytes and another cell type, osteoclasts. It turns out that CSF1 is not only necessary for the production of monocytes, 
from those stem cells, but also osteoclasts. Osteoclasts, while a part of bone tissue, aren't related to the other bone tissue cells, the osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, and osteocytes. Osteoclasts are related to monocytes and macrophages. So next we're going to take a look at an MRI of one of these tenosynovial giant cell tumors and see how this new compound worked. This figure from the publication shows three MRIs from one patient over the course of his or her treatment with the new compound PLX and in addition to the older drug Gleevec. Focusing on the bottom panel here, we can see two things. Outlined in green is the size of the tumor initially. In the dotted yellow area, this shows what the size of the synovial cavity should be. So we can see that this tumor is indeed significant. Over the course of treatment, we see that the tumor has shrunk. This is significant because previous treatments for these types of tumors often involved amputation of the joint. So there's hope that patients could avoid the necessity for that. Now, the two drugs were used in combination for a couple of reasons. The first one being that drug cocktails are often more effective than a single drug alone. Cancer cells can mutate rapidly. Not as rapidly as viruses and bacteria, but enough that drug-resistant strains can develop. By using two or more drugs at the same time, even if a cancer cell develops a resistance to the PLX compound, it would probably be killed off by Gleevec and vice versa. In the current paper, we see the results of both a phase one and a phase two trial. In the phase one portion, the authors were identifying the proper dose that was to be used in the next phase. And in phase two, the authors were reporting on the efficacy of the new compound. When determining efficacy, the authors are able to focus on ideal circumstances. The next step will be to do a phase three trial, which will involve a larger number of participants, as well as looking for something that we call efficiency. Efficiency is similar to efficacy, except that you don't get to focus on ideal circumstances. After that, the company can submit to the FDA for approval, and at that time give the drug a more interesting name than PLX number, 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 number. So there you have it. We reviewed our five basic types of white blood cells, focusing on monocytes, and learned that they were also related to osteoclasts, we went back and discussed our synovial joint anatomy and even my favorite hormone receptor interactions. So thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And maybe I will do another one of these in the near future.